Hi, my name is Drew and I'm going to be walking you through the Coachman today. Uh, starting right here up front, uh, we have an electric tongue jack. Uh, on or off switch here on the light. Uh, going to give you a point of reference if you are backing up to it in the dark. And uh, of course, light your coupler here if you're doing any of that after dark. Other than that, we do have up or down operation uh, on that jack to raise or lower that coupler. Uh, underneath this rubber plug that you see here, uh, that's going to expose the manual drive of the uh, tongue jack. Uh, you'll find a corresponding crank handle in the storage compartment here uh, to operate that up or down in the uh, event of a power loss situation. Uh, jumping back here uh, to these, these propane tanks, these are two 20 pound propane tanks. They will be full for you when you pick up your unit. Uh, open and close valve on the top. Uh, I find most people are somewhat familiar uh, with the operation of these, these 20 pound barbecue propane tanks. Uh, in between the two tanks, you do have a regulator. Uh, this will, uh, whichever way that this little arrow is pointing to, as long as that valve is open on top of the tank, you're gonna be drawing from that tank. Uh, once you have used the entirety of that tank, uh, you will then switch it over there to the other tank. Uh, flow indicator, uh, going to tell you if you do have any propane in said tank. Uh, green is, of course, means you have propane running through those lines. Uh, if it were to switch over to red, uh, that would, of course, mean you are out of propane. Uh, coming back here down to the uh, battery compartment here, of course, these aren't going to be the batteries that will be on the unit when you pick it up. We're going to switch these out with some brand new Interstate D-Cycle batteries. Uh, one thing uh, that you will need to do with those new batteries is going to maintain the water level. So on those, those batteries, uh, you'll have some vent panels. You just go ahead two or three times a year, pull those vent panels up, refill with distilled water as necessary. So there is a clear marked water line there. Uh, and our goal is to, of course, maintain that water level. Uh, on the top of the battery box, we're going to see a battery disconnect switch here. But anytime you are using this, this would need to be in that locked on position. Uh, it's not labeled on or off, just know that if it is locked in and you can't physically remove the key, then that would be connected. Uh, for periods of long-term storage, you are going to want to go ahead and disconnect, um, excuse me, disconnect the, the batteries or isolate the batteries from the system. Uh, that's going to help keep any nominal or phantom draws off the system uh, that from day to day uh, are not really any issue. Uh, but when compounded over many months in storage, again, could, could be a problem. So anytime you're storing the unit, just go ahead and disconnect that switch there. Uh, coming around here uh, to the side here, we have stabilizer jacks on all four corners. Uh, these are for stabilization. They're not for leveling. Uh, what that means for you is uh, if you're leveling from front to back, you're going to use the main tongue jack that we talked about. Leveling from left to right will be done with the tires and your choice of a leveling kit. Uh, once you are fairly certain of your level, uh, you will then run these stabilizer jacks down. Uh, this is a three quarter inch drive nut here on the jack itself. Uh, you can, of course, use the corresponding socket and ratchet if you were inclined to do so. Or, of course, this crank handle does come with the unit as well. Uh, slips right there onto that drive nut. Come down till you make contact with the pavement, maybe just a quarter turn more just to sure everything up. Same on the way up, uh, not something that you really need to bear down on or put a lot of weight on. Uh, you don't want to muscle those into position. Uh, large storage compartment here uh, from, you know, from a maintenance standpoint or, or uh, you know, there's nothing that, that you're going to be doing in here. It is just, again, a large pass through uh, storage compartment. Uh, we'll find some switches there on the other side to control the lights in the compartment and the lights up front. but. Uh, on the driver's side here, again, there's not really going to be much you're going to be doing there. Uh, what we have here is your uh, potable water fill. Uh, to fill that onboard water tank, you're going to stick a garden hose directly in there, fill it up to it overflows. Uh, once it is overflowing, um, that's of course your telltale sign that it is full. Uh, from there, you're going to turn the onboard water pump on to pressurize that system and draw that, that water up to the fixtures uh, and makes it usable. Uh, if we follow that train of thought down here to the underside, we're going to see a piece of PEX line there with a plug on the end. That's how we're going to drain that freshwater tank. So after it's been in use, uh, you will go ahead and drain it. 
Again, only does need to be drained anytime it has been physically filled up. So it's not going to like fill up off the city water connection or anything like that. So again, uh, just remove that plug on the end of that line and it's a gravity feed uh, and it will uh, of course drain from there. Tire pressure lug nuts. Uh, manufacturer recommends that anytime you are, uh, excuse me, at the beginning of each trip, they want you to go ahead and check the torque of those lug nuts. Uh, it is very important to maintain a, a hundred foot pounds of torque on these lug nuts uh, at any time. So just again, at the start of each trip, uh, just go ahead and check those lug nuts, make sure they are maintaining that hundred foot pounds of torque. Uh, 65 PSI is the max tire pressure rating stamped not only on the tire sidewall, as well as on this data tag here. And that is 65 PSI. That is again, the max tire pressure rating. That's exactly where we wanna run these uh, tires. That's gonna give you the highest flexibility in terms of weight rating, whether you're completely full or completely empty. Um, outside shower here, uh, nothing too crazy with that. Uh, do have access to hot and cold water here on off there on the head uh, to maintain some, some hot water. Uh, but again, this is all going to just kind of fit in here and coil up uh, around the fixture uh, for storage. Uh, down low here, got a couple things going on. We have your city water connection here. Uh, biggest thing with this city water connection is going to be pressure. So we do want to maintain a uh, anywhere between 40 to 75 PSI water pressure going into the unit. Uh, to do so, you're going to use a water pressure regulator. Uh, we will include one for your, with your starter kit. Uh, just make sure that you always do use that uh, water pressure regulator. Uh, beside that, we have what's called a black tank flush. Uh, this corresponds with a jet inside the black water tank specifically designed to help blast off compounded toilet waste, body waste, things like that. Uh, definitely do not want to get these two ports confused. Uh, of course, again, this one's going to be your city water connection. This one is going to be your black tank flush. Uh, biggest limitation to that black tank flush is again, there's no, there's no check valve. There's, there's nothing to keep that waste water in the tank if it were to be overfilled. Uh, what that means for you is the path of least resistance is the rooftop septic vents. So if you allow water rushing in here uh, for an extended period of time, it's gonna overflow that tank and, and eventually come out of the rooftop septic vents. So what I recommend my customers is uh, if you're by yourself, uh, don't allow water to rush in here for more than five minutes uh, without reaching down here and relieving that pressure off that black water valve, which we'll kind of get to that more here in just a moment. Uh, or if you have a, a friend uh, or somebody with you, uh, they can go ahead and watch the panel on the inside, the monitor panel uh, with water coming in here uh, and then, you know, tell you when to stop or when you're getting close to being full. That way, again, you can reach down and, and relieve that pressure there. Uh, what we have down here below those is going to be your cable satellite inlets. Uh, those are just a standard RG6 cable fitting. That is a pass-through connection to the designated TV areas of the camper. Some higher-end campgrounds will offer a park cable service or just about every satellite provider these days is offering an aftermarket satellite package geared towards RVers. Either way, this would be the inlet of these services. Uh, and again, they will pass through to the designated TV area. Uh, 30 amp, 110 volt power supply here, uh, only plugs into the camper one way. So you'll come here, uh, as you can see, only does make sense that it's gonna plug in one way. You'll give it a, you'll plug it straight in, give it an eighth inch turn to the right, that locks it in. Then we do have this secondary collar here, we can screw down and lock it in further if we're inclined to do so. Uh, other than that, again, part of your starter kit, we do include a 30 to 15 amp producer. That's helpful if you want to plug into the, your, your, you know, a standard 15 amp household outlet in your garage or something. Uh, again, that's going to be part of your uh, starter kit. Uh, and that's, that's helpful if you want to like pre-cool the refrigerator or something like that. Uh, I would refrain from putting a, a, you know, a, a large load on that uh, reducer. So I wouldn't run your air conditioner or your microwave for an extended period of time on that 30 to 15 amp reducer. So something to keep in mind there. So we have your dump valves down here. Uh, we have black for black water, gray for gray water. Uh, black water is gonna be anything that comes from the toilet, you know, solid body waste. Uh, gray is going to be anything that comes from the sink or the shower. 
and then you have a bayonet fitting there in between. These valves are in the closed position as they sit now. Uh, to open either one, it is just going to be a six inch pull uh, out. So Blackwater valve starting with that one. That one's going to main, that's one's going to stay in the closed position just about any time you are using the, the unit. Uh, you'll keep that in the closed position, use the monitor panel on the inside and only dump as necessary. It is very important uh, to keep that, that solid body waste in as wet or flowing condition as you can so it will be easily expressed uh, here through the bayonet fitting. Uh, gray water is not as important on whether or not you keep that open or closed uh, during use. Uh, of course, there's no solid body waste. There's no solid waste, I should say, uh, in that line to prevent it from draining properly. Uh, biggest thing is, though, is these two valves should never be open at the same time. Uh, you don't want to have any cross-contamination issues or anything like that. Um, a popular option would be to dump the, dump the black water here once that's fully uh, been fully dumped, you're going to close that black water back and then pull this gray water and allow that uh, gray water to rinse your sewage hose and this part of the shared plumbing here. Uh, sewage hose is going to connect the very same way this cap comes off. So you got four prongs there uh, along the outside of that pipe. You just put the keyhole in the halfway position, uh, give it a quarter inch turn. That's going to go ahead and lock that septic, uh, or excuse me, that, that uh, sewage hose onto the bayonet fitting there. So. Uh, and then also not far from there, uh, we have your low point drains here. So these are your low point drains. Those are the lowest point in the unit's plumbing. Uh, that's how you're gonna drain everything in between water source and fixture is gonna be drained via those two ports there. Um, you'll be doing that anytime the unit's gonna be in storage for more than seven days. So. Uh, kind of a three-point process to draining the water from the camper. Number one is going to be the fresh water tank. If it's been in use, we already went over that. Next, you're going to come back here to the low point drains. We're going to drain those. Lastly, you would finish up with the water heater. And we can hop over there and kind of start talking about that now. So uh, this is your, your six-gallon capacity water heater. Uh, this is... Uh, runs on propane gas as well as 110 volt electricity. Um, manufacturer has two very specific recommendations. Uh, number one is going to be uh, anytime again the unit's going to be in storage for more than seven days, we want to go ahead and drain this. And number two, uh, before using it, uh, you do need to prime it. Uh, what that means for you is just pumping six gallons of water back into it before lighting it uh, to avoid a dry fire kind of scenario. Uh, when it comes to draining it, uh, you'll drain this only after you have drained the freshwater tank and the low point drains like we just spoke of. Uh, very important to uh, follow a certain sequence of events here uh, to keep yourself from getting burned, uh, scalded I should say, or uh, you know anything like that. So uh, first things first is give it ample time to cool down, a lot longer than a lot of people think, so about eight hours I would recommend. Uh, once you are fairly confident of the temperature, uh, you can go ahead and relieve the pressure. Uh, easiest way for you to relieve the pressure is going to be using the hot side of any spigot. So cut the flow of water into the unit, uh, turn that hot side of the spigot on. Again, you can use any fixture to do this. Uh, once that fixture stops, once you stop seeing water at that fixture, uh, that is your indicator that the pressure has been relieved from here. Uh, and you can go ahead and, and finish up the draining procedure, which from there is just going to be uh, attaching onto that drain plug with a 15 16 wrench, uh, backing that drain plug out and allowing the rest, you know, at this point it's probably going to be four or five gallons of water uh, to drain out of the unit from there. Uh, again, uh, manufacturer recommends on the flip side of that to, to, to prime the unit before lighting it. Uh, to do that, uh, it's going to be very similar to depressurizing it, uh, but this time you are going to introduce water to the unit, whether that be the city water connection uh, or the potable water. Uh, once you have water flowing to the unit, uh, you're just going to turn again the hot side of any, any fixture on. Uh, that flow is initially going to be very bubbly, very spitty, very interrupted. Uh, as that flow normalizes, that is the indicator that you do have water. 
in the unit, you can go ahead and choose, choose your power source uh, from the monitor panel on the inside. Uh, so those are going to be the recommendations uh, from the manufacturer to keep this in good working order, as well as uh, protecting it from the intrusion of mud daubers and flying insects. Uh, they like to nest in these appliances, not, not only the, the water heater here, but the refrigerator here. Uh, it is our goal to, to keep them from nesting in the appliance. Um, and to do that, uh, we are, again, just going to screen the inlet here uh, as well here on the refrigerator vent. Uh, we're going to screen these off further. And again, they make specialty aftermarket screens specifically cut for each one of these appliance appliances. And again, it is our recommendation to, uh, you know, go ahead and, and purchase those. Or if you're crafty, go ahead and DIY it. Either way, uh, definitely want to make sure that it is done. So once you have the screens in place, uh, you would go ahead and you're going to want to pay attention to where your hose is routed. So you want that to be routed uh, at least up against the grade. Of course, if you have that screen in there, uh, you're probably only going to be able to get it like that. But as long as it's pointed in the right direction, uh, that's going to be all right. Uh, we put the tabs up in first, uh, line up the holes here as best you can. And sometimes they like to, to fight you a little bit. Uh, but once those are in place, you're going to go ahead and give it a quarter turn there. Uh, that will go ahead and lock it on there. So, uh, so here we have your rooftop ladder access here. Uh, brings me to a good point, which is going to be maintenance uh, of your seals. So you have a, a few types of seals. Uh, on the top, uh, you're going to use a self-leveling lap sealant uh, to, to touch up any degradation in those seals. Uh, you would source that from any RV dealer. Uh, what that maintenance schedule is going to entail is once every 90 days, climb up there. Uh, again, inspect those seals for any cracking, splitting, peeling, anything like that on the roof. Uh, and then touch up again with an RV grade uh, lap sealant uh, that you will source from your RV dealer. Now anywhere here on the body where two pieces come together, uh, you're going to use a 100% silicone product. Uh, and again, those are going to be on that same maintenance schedule. So what that again is gonna sound like is, is once every 90 days, any place where, where two pieces come together, uh, and then on the roof, you're going to expect, inspect uh, and touch up as necessary. So uh, that is going to be the maintenance schedule with, with the seals there. Uh, coming around here uh, to this side, uh, standard kind of RV style handrail, uh, which would be up and over in this scenario uh, for travel. It will fold across the door. Of course, you can't fold it the other way because of the awning. And again, that is up and out there uh, and it will lock in that out position uh, like so. Uh, steps are up and in. So again, nothing too crazy with that up and in and then down and out. Uh, outside grill here. Um, this is not one that we typically see on here. This is a Coleman style. Uh, this of course, as you can see, has never been used. Uh, this is going to accept the one pound propane, uh, cylinders that you would, uh, the Coleman branded, uh, one pound cylinders. Uh, and then again, you have all kind of the bits and bops here of setting that up, uh, as well as the instructions. So this does all slide back in there. Um, Again, not much to it is, is a standard Coleman style cooktop, runs on the one pound propane bottles, does have a service manual right there on top uh, for assembly and things like that. So, so just keep that in mind. Uh, down below that, we do have a couple all weather 110 volt outlets. Again, nothing too crazy, just some, some 15 amp outlets. Uh, beside that, we have your, uh, your furnace vent. Uh, that is an exhaust vent. So of course we, we wanna make sure that it is exhausting properly. Uh, we don't want to block it off with any lawn chairs or anything that you may have out here in your kind of patio area. Uh, and again, uh, to sound like a broken record, it is a, a very large intrusion point for mud daubers and flying insects. Uh, so we'll, again, we will want to use a screen uh, to go ahead and, and keep those from nesting on the inside of the appliance. And then over here, we have another RG6 cable fitting. What we saw on the other side were the inlets of those uh, services, this would be the outlet. So they, they run it 
uh, here. So if you were to hook a TV on the outside here, uh, of course, you could watch your programming here outside. Uh, what we have here is a Furon branded solar plug. Uh, this is a proprietary connection that, uh, to the best of my knowledge, is only going to accept a Furon uh, panel. So uh, that is essentially a plug and play connection to the battery. Uh, once you, of course, if, if you have that Furon panel, all you would do is, is plug directly into that. Uh, and then again, it is, it is pretty much plug and play. Their charge controller from there on out uh, is gonna do any battery maintenance uh, that is necessary. Uh, then here in this main storage compartment, um, we have a table uh, that is strapped in here. You have a couple uh, straps there to hold that. That's a standard kind of card table, uh, card style table with the folding legs. And then we have our light switches here uh, this main switch is going to be for the either side of the lights on the, the front of the camper. So you have a couple uh, lights and then this one here is going to be the main compartment light. And those lights are these ones here. So it's going to control these LEDs, that first switch. So. Uh, that just about covers it here on the outside. Uh, we're going to hop on the inside, start going over that stuff. So coming right here into the... In Inside the unit, uh, first thing we're going to be met with is going to be your main monitor panel. Uh, this is going to give you uh, main function uh, functionality uh, or control over everything, uh, as well as your convenience center here. That's going to give you a real-time readout of your tanks. Uh, you have awning controls here, uh, water heater controls here, water pump, things like that. So starting up here with the uh, convenience center or courtesy panel as, as it goes by many names uh, this is again going to give you a real-time readout of where your tanks sit now battery is full battery is going to read full uh, anytime we are plugged into shore power it's putting 13.5 constantly to those batteries uh, to keep them topped off uh, when we're looking at the battery we're going to go by this bottom the bottom indicators uh, that is low fair good and charged uh, and then if we're reading the tanks, we're going to go by the top display, which has empty, third, two-thirds, full. And then as I push these, you can see the lights correspond with the level of full uh, on each of those things. Uh, and then down below here, we have your water heater switches. Uh, we have electric is the first one, gas is the second one. So both sources is going to give you 17 gallons per hour. Uh, next up in terms of efficiency is going to be standalone gas. Uh, that's going to, you're looking at like 15 gallons per hour recharge. And then last is going to be electric with 11 gallons uh, an hour recharge. Uh, you can again run both sources at the same time or as they, those, those sources present themselves. Uh, next up is going to be a water pump here. Uh, that's how we're running the unit today. So we have water in the tanks. We're drawing that up to the fixture. Uh, we use that for testing purposes, uh, so we have went through all these fixtures, making sure everything is, is uh, up to snuff. Uh, now, next up, we have your entry lights. Your, your porch light here behind me, can't see that. I don't know if you can see that, but uh, porch light there on the outside, it's going to be that switch there. And then we have your living room lights here, uh, which is just your main uh, ceiling light switch. If you are coming into the unit at dark, you can just hit one. Uh, standard switch to go ahead and, and turn those on and then we have your awning switch here and as you can see this awning here on the outside uh, is a momentary switch so if I take my finger off the switch it's going to go ahead and, and stop moving uh, it is important that you are making sure you're going in the right direction now if we fully extend this awning uh, there is nothing to to stop it uh, automatically so uh, what could happen is you could uh, potentially run that awning back in inside out if you were to to uh, indefinitely hold that into the extend position and of course that's not good for uh, the awning so we want to refrain from doing that um, coming around here uh, we have your fire extinguisher uh, it does have a green test tab on the top uh, very important that we do test all of our safety equipment every time we take the unit out uh, press down on that green tab. If it springs back up, that means you still have some life in it. Uh, if not, if it stays depressed, then it's, it's time to replace. Uh, and then we have your Dometic refrigerator here. Um, 
Very easy to navigate here. You have your on off switch. Once you turn that on, it's going to go through a boot up. Uh, it's going to send you into that auto mode uh, right off the rip. Uh, what that auto mode means is that it's, it's of course, if 110 volt electri electricity is available, it's going to default to that. Uh, and if it is not available or becomes interrupted, it's going to automatically start lighting on gas. Uh, and then the only other button on the, the display here is going to be that standalone gas button. Uh, there is no indicator on whether or not it is actually running on gas, uh, or no light, I should say. Uh, what you'll be looking at is the, the orientation of the button. So if it's depressed, you'd be running in auto, and if we hit that, it's going to be in gas. Uh, Check light here is just going to alert you of any problems, uh, whether you're in, again, 110 volt or, or gas mode. Uh, down low here, we have your views panel breaker box. Uh, everything here on the top side is gonna be your automotive blade style fuses. They are labeled there in terms of function. Uh, not a bad idea to pick up a variety pack of fuses. Uh, keep them with the unit. And then down below, we have your uh, light switch style breakers, uh, just like at home. So those are resettable if you have any problems with those. And again, they are labeled there. Hopping in here into the bathroom. Uh, not too terribly much to, to really speak of in here. You have a pedal flush toilet. It'll be a light to press to fill up the bowl. Uh, full press to flush. Uh, rooftop fan. We'll want to crank that up there. Uh, biggest thing with this is, of course, you do want to make sure that it is closed before going down the road. Uh, I often make the joke that it's something that you only forget once because oftentimes it's not going to be there when you get to where you're going. So make sure you do uh, go ahead and close that down when you're not using it, uh, definitely before uh, getting on the road. Uh, other than that, standard uh, shower here. Um, RV shower, I should say. You do have that on-off switch uh, again. Uh, as well as hot and cold there on the fixture. Uh, main GFI outlet is located in the bathroom. Uh, what that means is all the receptacles are on the same circuit. If one of them gets overloaded, they all follow suit. Uh, this would be the reset point, just like in your bathroom at home, you'll have one uh, of these as well. Uh, and again, that is the main GFI outlet. Uh, light switch there on the, mall, on the wall, uh, medicine cabinet, you know, kind of things like that. I like to call them the usual suspects. Uh, on this wall here, uh, we've got kind of a lot going on as well. We have your furnace, of course. Uh, you have a pretty stiff on-off switch there uh, when it comes to your furnace, so we need to turn that on first, and that is uh, towards the left or towards me in this scenario, and it is labeled, so that's on there. Uh, from there, we have this little slider on the bottom, and that's, again, hard to see, but we're going to choose a, a comfort level from there. Uh, that blower motor generally comes on immediately. Uh, 16 seconds after that, it ignites. By the 30 second mark, it's producing noticeable heat. Uh, and again, in this particular unit, all of your heat is going to come uh, from right there. Uh, and that should be sufficient. Uh, these things, they, they produce a, a ton of heat uh, and you're not looking to heat up a large space, so they work really well. Uh, we'll go ahead and cut that off. It should will take about two minutes to cool down from there. Uh, then we have a 15 amp outlet here. And then again, another very important piece of safety equipment there is going to be your carbon monoxide LP leak detector. Uh, and again, we do want to test the safety equipment every time before we take the unit out. Uh, it does have a test button, uh, functions very much like a smoke alarm, and does have flashing lights that indicate which gas it is sensing. So uh, again, we'll want to test that out. Uh, jackknife sofa here. Uh, this is a kind of cool little uh, one that I haven't seen before. You have little little USB chargers in the uh, cup holders with some lights, uh, blue lights, which is cool. Um, and then we can fold that up. And if we lift up on it and follow it down, that's going to give us a secondary sleeping area, uh, what we would call a jackknife sofa. And then again, on the way up, you just lift the front, kind of help the rear, and there you go. And then you have these kind of...
kind of TV style trays uh, since you do not have a dinette. Um, here in the kitchen area, uh, of course, you notice this bright light. Uh, it does have a couple brightness settings uh, on it, uh, but the switch is right there on the fixture. Um, you know, kind of, again, kind of usual suspects as again, uh, just want to get these turned on for you so you can see those. Uh, and then you have your countertop extender here uh, to give you some more room if you're prepping any meals or anything like that. Um, you know, cabinetry stuff in here. Um, again, really, really kind of standard stuff uh, that you're going to generally see in these. Uh, cooktop here. Uh, this is a Furon cooktop. Uh, you get these nice lights. Um, also, you have a lighted oven, which is not something you generally see, uh, as well as you have the ability to light that oven pilot light uh, right up, up top here, uh, which is, again, not something you generally see. So uh, in this scenario, if we were trying to light that oven, we are going to turn uh, to the flame there, uh, and then we hold this in. Uh, well, holding this in, we're going to come here to the other side of the cooktop and spark it there. Uh, now, what we're looking for is a pilot light. And again, I'm not sure if we're going to be able to get this on camera, um, especially without my light. Uh, but again, maybe hard to see, uh, but you would see a little pilot light if it were lit there. Now, again, we're, we'll try and see see if we can get it to light. Well, I'm not going to spend too much time on, on getting that to light. Uh, if you do have any more questions about that, don't hesitate to give us a call. Uh, it, is, it is, again, very simple, especially if you've ever uh, lit any other appliance with a, a pilot light. Um, lights up top here, fan, again, uh, something that I consider a usual suspect. Uh, microwave, standard one-of-the-mill microwave, uh, just like you have at home. Uh, again, nothing really uh, crazy or different with that. Um, coming around here to the TV area, um, unit has a uh, omnidirectional rooftop digital antenna uh, to bring in any over-the-air digital uh, TV programming. Uh, let's see if I can get this TV pulled out and out of the way. Um, slightly, I don't think so. So I don't know if you can see this green light on the camera there, uh, but that is controlled by this button here. And what that does is that just turns on that rooftop antenna. Uh, from there, what you'll do is you'll go through the uh, menu on the television uh, and do a channel search. That's going to automatically bring in uh, the, the best case scenario in terms of, of programming. Uh, and it does it all automatically as long as that green light's on. So make sure that's on. Uh, from there, we'll just turn on the television. Um, you know, most importantly, it does need to be buckled in uh, here before going down the road. And it looks like it can come out here and angle towards the bedroom uh, if you were doing that. And then of course it is visible there from the couch. Uh, this is going to be uh, kind of your multimedia center, uh, AM, FM, radio, Bluetooth, CD, DVD, uh, all, of those, all of that is going to be utilized on this single display here, as well as both zones of speakers. You have zone one, which is going to be inside, zone two, which is going to be outside. Um, and then, of course, these are going to be uh, your menu functions. Bluetooth is here. So Bluetooth there, uh, radio, excuse me, this would be your menu button. So that's going to take you through the menu uh, options, uh, 3.5 millimeter ends, uh, as well as uh, USB in as well. So uh, it does have its own service manual. Uh, again, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to give us a call. Uh, we can walk you through most of this stuff there on the phone. Um, air conditioner here, kind of something we skipped over. Uh, you have two options. So you have a mode, you have your, your mode button, your mode of operation and your thermostat here. So, uh, 
Uh, if we're looking at this, the blue is going to be conditioned air. You have a low, medium, and high fan speed. The black here is going to only be uh, fan. So you can kind of, you have this, this optional key, which this does not carry that option, but if you were inclined to add it, you could. Uh, so we'll skip over that. That's just going to be, as it sits now, it's just going to be another fan speed. Uh, and that, that's going to take us actually into the air conditioner uh, side of things here. And then, of course, we make sure that this is on the cool side. Um, and, uh, you know, that's it. So you, you control your temperature with this here. Uh, now we can go the other way, and that's going to just be those same fan speeds, uh, but no compressor, just, just fan only. Uh, and then you have louvers uh, on each side to directionalize the air, uh, as well as these scoops here to push that air straight down. So, um, Coming here into the bedroom, uh, up top here we have a, your smoke alarm is a standard 9-volt battery smoke alarm, just like at home. It'll let you know when it needs to be replaced. Uh, nothing much to it. Again, part of your safety equipment, something we want to test every single time we take the unit out. Uh, USBs and 110 volt outlets on both sides of the bed. Um, so you can charge phones, run CPAP machines, anything like that uh, on each side of the bed there. Uh, we do have under bed storage, which is nice, a very efficient use of space. Um, and we have these lights here. Uh, now those come on blue. If we hold them for a couple seconds longer, they do turn to a bright white LED. Uh, and then of course your cabinetry here. Uh, nothing too crazy with that. Uh, we have a vent uh, above the, the bed here. Uh, now this, there's, there's no fan or anything in that, uh, but this is going to be pre-wired for a, the addition of a fan. Uh, so if you are client inclined to add one at a later date, uh, you have the opportunity to do so. Um, fire exit here in the bedroom. This is going to be your main fire exit. If your the door is blocked, uh, if you are particularly motivated enough, uh, you can go ahead and yank this screen out. Uh, and once you do that, this window will come full out like a doggy door. Uh, again, so if you're particularly motivated enough, you can go ahead and hop on out. Uh, I think that just about covers it here on the inside. Uh, again, if you do have any questions or anything that, that may have been missed or, or we can explain further, uh, please don't hesitate to give us a call. Again, we can walk you through most of this stuff here uh, over the phone. Um, so if you have any questions, just let us know. Thank you.